Hello everybody, this is Dr. Ashur. Uh, today we are gonna continue our series of videos about peptic ulcer. In the beginning, we talked about the uh, pathophysiology of the disease. Uh, second video was about the treatment of the disease using uh, two classes only of, of these drugs, uh, the H2 blockers and the proton pump inhibitors. Today we are gonna continue the treatment of peptic ulcer where we will talk about the anti-H pylori drugs, prostaglandin analogs, anticholinergic agents, and antacids. Okay, so uh, we will start first with the anti-helicobacter pylori drugs. I gave it number three because previously we talked about H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors. So H pylori is a gram-negative bacteria. It colonizes the gastric mucosa in more than 50% of the human population worldwide, very common, and persists despite the strong host immune response and the very aggressive environment that this bacterium is in, in the, uh, around it is the HCL pH is about one very corrosive, and pepsin, I mean digestive uh, uh, protease, and other uh, very aggressive environment, but this, uh, uh, this bacterium can live within this harsh environment. How? We'll see. So uh, infection with this bacteria results in gastric inflammation. Okay, they produce uh, proteases and they have the capability of the adhesion, also permeabilization and all of these effects. They, this, that's, therefore, they cause gastritis and development of uh, peptic ulcer, gastric adenocarcinoma even. Uh, the, this uh, this uh, bacteria produces toxins that can directly damage the mucosa. As we said, they can produce proteases. They can uh, also, uh, uh, as we'll see next, uh, they can increase the acidity of the stomach uh, by increasing the production of gastrin and other effects we'll see in the next slide. And they cause epithelial monolayer permeabilization. So uh, there will be easy uh, passage of uh, of, uh, of minerals and nutrients out of the cell, so the cell could be could easily die. Uh, because of the critical role of this uh, microorganism in peptic ulcer disease pathogenesis, its eradication is now standard care in patients with positive uh, H. pylori and uh, gastric or duodenal ulcers. Uh, eradication of this by, uh, H. pylori result in healing of active peptic ulcers and low recurrence rates. So H. pylori and the exogenous non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs interact in, a, in complex ways to cause ulcers. You know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs inhibit the production of prostaglandins, which itself, uh, I mean, which these uh, signaling molecules, they inhibit HL secretion, they enhance the production of mucus, uh, uh, bicarbonate, and uh, they also enhance their mucosal blood flow. So uh, up to so the, the combination between this uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, when the patient is uh, H. pylori positive, this will result in a severe ulcer and also enhance the recurrence rates. Uh, up to 60% of peptic ulcer, uh, these patients are associated uh, with H. pylori infection in the stomach. So huge. I mean, percentage is already associated with H. pylori, and whenever it's there, the condition is very bad. So uh, here, uh, just this uh, diagram shows how helicobacter, helicobacter pylori, uh, you know, uh, acclimatize to this harsh environment around this microorganism, and also attack the surrounding gastric tissues. How? Let's start it. This H. pylori, they produce an enzyme called urease. So this will, uh, uh, degrade urea, okay, and produce ammonium hydroxide, okay. Ammonium hydroxide itself, the pH is about 10, so it's basic, okay. So this will increase the pH. So now the number one, the bacterium itself makes makes sure that it is surrounded by um, favorable, uh, no pH, almost neutral, because you have the H.5 almost with the uh, ammonium hydroxide. And also the pH of the HCL is one or two, two. So uh, the pH around it's almost neutral, about six, seven, about seven almost. So, so this is number one. 
Increasing pH itself, if you remember, we said increasing pH increase the production of uh, gas strain from G cells in the antrum, right? Uh, so this will increase production of gastrin. Gastrin itself, as we know, will act on the parietal cells, okay, on the CCK2 receptors, and activate the uh, HCL secretion. Can also, as we said last time, activate the release of histamine from ECL cells, histamine act on H2 receptors, and also activate the production of HCL, okay? So gastrin also, okay, can also enhance the parietal cell and ECL uh, 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 proliferation, okay? So this also can enhance the, 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 the proliferation of these cells, will enhance the production of acid, and also can cause cancer also. So now at least we know the pathogenesis of carcinogenesis induced by this microorganism. Okay, this will increase acid secretion. And this, you know, a very important parameter in development of, pepti of butenal ulcer specifically, because we know the, the issue in butenal ulcer mainly is in the increase the production of HCL, whereas in uh, gastric ulcer, the issue is mainly, mainly in the uh, issue, uh, issues in the protective barriers or protective mechanisms. So increased HCL uh, can induce uh, more of butenal ulcer, which it itself is more common even than uh, gastric ulcer. Okay, uh, the other pathway, H. pylori, also in, in, induces the production of inflammatory mediators, which inhibit the D cells. We said before D cells produce somatostatin. If you if you forgot, we said T T T D. Oh, it's very similar. So this is uh, uh, kind of a simple uh, mnemonic to remember. D uh, produce the somatostatin. Somatostatin, we know it, it inhibits the production of gastrin from the G cells. But now we are inhibiting the D cells. So no production of somatostatin, no inhibition of gastrin, so more gastrin is produced, or no inhibition of gastrin. Gastrin is produced, and at the same time, the ammonium hydroxide uh, increasing pH would activate the production of, uh, uh, of gastrin from G cells, and as we said, this will enhance the HCL secretion and enhance the duodenal, duodenal, duodenal ulcer uh, formation. Okay, active H. pylori therapy is therefore now recommended in ulcer, on ulcer patients, peptic ulcer patients generally who uh, are test who test positive for H. pylori. So whenever the patient is test, uh, testing positive, so uh, it's uh, recommended that he or she receives uh, therapy for H. pylori. Uh, treatment, there are so many regimens for treatment of H. pylori. One of the most common ones and it's also FDA approved, uh, uh, contains uh, the lanzoprazole, the proton pump inhibitor. Again, I received the questions before, why proton pump not H2 blocker? Is it, uh, because it, uh, proton pump inhibitor is very potent, and you have now very harsh uh, environment caused by the H pylori. Uh, amoxicillin, okay, it's, uh, you know, penicillin, and clarithromycin, which is a microlite antibiotic, the combination of these two drugs results in a a kind of a synergism, and also we use here 1,000 milligram amoxicillin suitable for twice a day, and the clarithromycin already is twice a day, so we can give them twice a day for two weeks, okay, and this regimen results in about 90% eradication rate. The next class is prostaglandin analogs, okay, we said before prostaglandin is one of the guardians, okay, that protect the uh, gastric mucosa against this harsh environment, this gastric mucosa is living in the prostaglandin includes PGE2 and PGI2. They promote uh, mucus and bicarbonate secretion, and we as we ex uh, explained before, they increase mucosal blood flow, so the cells will be you know receiving the the, the required nutrition, the oxygen, blood supply, uh, uh, carrying the nutrients, oxygen, everything. So and also bicarbonate comes through also the blood. So everything will be fine, and also this will enhance the restitution also and cell regeneration, so cells will be in a very good shape. Uh, they also inhibit gastrin production and inhibit acid secretion. So they increase the you know, protective factors and inhibit the aggressive factors. But they have the natural prostaglandins like PGE2, PGI2, uh, they, are, they have very short half-life, okay? So uh, the, uh, the, the, the companies, you know, try to develop uh, PD, PG analogs, prostaglandin analogs with longer half-life, okay? And mesoprostol was one of these, the most common ones, mesoprostol, mesoprostol. 
So uh, mesoprostol, okay, is a synthetic analog of prostaglandin E1, which will do these above functions, okay? So uh, the, the structural modifications, generally speaking, of the prostaglandin analogs uh, uh, increase potency of the prostaglandin, duration of anti-secretory effect, we we'll say there are inhibition of two secretions, gastrin and acid, which is L. Uh, duration of anti-secretory uh, uh, oral availability makes them uh, orally uh, active and also increase the safety of these uh, prostaglandins. Uh, since non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs suppress prostaglandin uh, formation by inhibiting cyclooxygenase, synthetic prostaglandins and uh, prostaglandin analogs such as mesoprostol offer a logical approach to reducing non-steroid and anti-inflammatory drugs induced mucosal damage, as we said. These inhibit prostaglandin. Now I'm, I'm introducing prostaglandin uh, in the form of uh, mesoprostol. Uh, the degree of inhibition, and that's why they develop uh, this uh, uh, combination between diclofenac, Voltaren, and the, art, the uh, mesoprostol in the form of a brand name called Arthrotec. So mesoprostol plus diclofenac, there is a brand name called Arthrotec that's already in the market to protect against development of peptic ulcer induced by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as diclofenac. Uh, the degree of inhibition of gastric acid secretion by mesoprostol uh, is, is directly related to the dose, oral dose of 100 uh, to 200 milligrams significantly inhibit basal acid secretion, okay? We know basal acid secretion means no meal, okay? About 95% and also for the acid secretion by about 85%. The original recommended dose for ulcer prophylaxis is 200 milligrams four times a day. So I have an issue here with the compliance. If I ask the patient to take a drug four times a day versus, uh, we said before, even uh, a protopopin emptors could be even taken once a day. h blocker could be taken once a day, maximum twice a day. Now we're talking about four times a day. The pharmacokinetics. Mesoprostol is rapidly absorbed after oral administration. It's rapidly uh, and extensively de-esterified to form Mesoprostol acid. This is the active form. This is the principal and active form of the drug. So, uh, mesoprostol after deesterification, okay, uh, it forms the uh, uh, mesoprostol, mesoprostol, just mesoprostol, the word mesoprostol, just add the word acid. Okay, this is the active form of the drug. A single dose inhibits acid production within 30 minutes, very fast. Therapeutic effect peaks within uh, one hour to one and a half hours, and the last for about three hours. Uh, however, food, food and antacids decrease the rate of mesoprostol absorption, resulting in delayed and decreased peak plasma concentration of the active metabolite, so we have to space them out. The free acid is excreted, this free acid is excreted mainly in the urine. Uses as FDA, FDA approved to prevent non steroid and anti muscle drugs induced uh, mucosal injury. Okay, however, it's rarely used okay, because of adverse effect and the inconvenience of the four time, times daily dosing. Okay, adverse effect diarrhea, it's prostaglandin, okay, with uh, or without abdominal pain and cramps. Uh, exacerbation of uh, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, and they, thus uh, should be avoided in patients with uh, IBD. Mesoprostol can get during pregnancy because it can increase the uterine contractility, okay? Uh, the next class is the anticholinergic drugs. Okay, we know the parasympathetic nervous system uh, through the muscarinic receptors, it activates peristalt peristaltic movement and uh, also enhance the secretion, right? So uh, the amount, so that's why they develop anticholinergic drugs to inhibit this effect the effect that induce uh, acid, I mean, the, 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 the secretions and the motility, okay, so we need something to inhibit this, to so use anticholinergic drugs. The first one that comes to mind is, uh, is atropine, but atropine inhibits everything, M1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, right? We need something selected, as we'll see. So uh, if I use the muscarinic receptor antagonist, the amount of acid, uh, pepsin, and mucine can be reduced, okay, by large doses of atropine, However, so many side effects, including cardiac arrhythmia, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, all of these are related to the non-selective activity of uh, atropine inhibiting, like for well, cardiac, I mean, ME2 and the others. So it can inhibit all five subtypes of 
muscarinic receptors. So we need something selective. That's why uh, pyrenezepine and telenzepine have been developed, which are M1, M1 muscarinic receptor antagonists. They are selective for M1 receptor. Uh, we have seen before uh, the, 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 the muscarinic antagonists in clinical use are M1, not M3. M3 is, is, is expressed on the surface of parietal cells, but the one, the drugs that are developed for peptic ulcer uh, as anticholinergic drugs are uh, M1 selective antagonists such as pyrenezepine. Antilenzepine is more potent than pyrenezepine. They reduce basal acid secretion by 40 to 50 percent with fewer adverse effects than atropine. Okay. Uh, although acetylcholine receptor uh, on the parietal cell itself is M3, these drugs are claimed to suppress neural uh, stimulation of acid production by action on M1 receptors on the enteric nervous system cells, okay, as you'll see in the next uh, uh, graph. Due to their uh, relatively uh, poor efficacy, significant and undesirable anticholinergic uh, side effects, and risk of blood disorders such as uh, uh, pyrenezepine can use some blood disorders they are rarely now used nowadays, okay? And by the way, H2 blockers are much more potent than anticholinergic drugs. So we're talking about now about uh, uh, proton pump inhibitors, H2 blocker, and then anticholinergic drugs with all, all of their side effects. So are, they are rarely used. Mechanism, uh, just in details. So we say they act on M1 receptor. M1 receptor, okay? Aspyrocholine uh, activate M1 receptor on the surface of the ANS cells. Uh, and this will produce a spiculine which will activate muscular receptors on the surface of uh, ECL uh, cells, enterochromaffin like cells that produce histamine, histamine activate H2 receptors, H2 receptors activate the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, adenylate cyclase, um, uh, ATP to cyclic A and B, cyclic B activate protein kinase which activate the uh, movement of the uh, proton pump from the cytoplasm into the cell membrane and then their production of H, okay, proton, okay, in exchange for potassium, which will bind to CL. We now have HCL, right? So this is the exact mechanism, okay, the detailed mechanism. However, the other mechanism is not involved. We don't use these because this we can use, but we can use, we need to use a non-selective muscarinic antagonist, which will have so many uh, uh, adverse uh, effects. Uh, the next class is antacids. From the name antacids, okay, so they are anti-acid. They just neutralize, just alkali with acid. It will produce salt and water, right? That's it. Okay, so they diminish gastric acidity this way, neutralizing uh, gastric, neutralize gastric acid and relieve associated pain and nausea, reduce delivery of acid into the duodenum uh, following a meal. So now, if you, are, if, you, if you eat a meal, you know, gastrin production increases, HCL production increases. So if you take the antacids after meal, they will inhibit the, uh, or they bind to the HCL and neutralize HCL. So less amount of HCL is going to the duodenum, less uh, duodenal ulcer and less pain. Because pepsin is inactive at pH uh, greater than 4, we say pepsin needs HCL, right? We need, it needs more pH to be activated. Antacids also reduce pepsin activity and inhibit hydrolysis of mucose, mucosal proteins by pepsin. So here, it, the antacids dealt with the two things, the two main aggressive factors, the HCL by neutralizing the HCL, and also when they neutralize HCL, this will inhibit the activation of pepsin from the pepsinogen into the pepsin form. This will inhibit the hydrolysis of mucosal proteins by pepsin. Uh, examples of these drugs include uh, sodium bicarbonate, calcium bicarbonate, magnesium salts, and aluminium hydroxide. Features, mm -hmm. sodium bicarbonate is very fast. The effect is very fast. However, they produce carbon dioxide, which causes pelching, distension. Uh, excess of sodium bicarbonate can cause metabolic alkalosis. Okay. It's best avoid in renal and cardiovascular disease. Okay. Because you have so many sodium. Okay. Sodium will increase the blood volume and uh, uh, enhance the pre increase the preload on the heart. Calcium carbonate, okay, they have a high acid neutralizing capacity, but however, there is an acid rebound. Acid rebound means after you stop, after you take the calcium carbonate, feel happy, okay. Now, I you know I've been relieved from this heartburn, okay, everything is okay. Not after some time, the acid will come again and you feel the, uh, the heartburn even worse, okay. So if you use excess of calcium carbonate, it can, can cause hypercalcemia and constipation. 
The two most common uh, drugs that are used are magnesium tricilicate and aluminum hydroxide. Okay, magnesium salts, they have poor solubility, so this is good because we need them to stay in the GIT. We don't need them to be absorbed. Uh, but they are weak acids, a weak antacids. Okay, the tricilicate inactivate pepsin. And also aluminum also inactivate pepsin. Okay, inactivate pepsin. Okay, so both inactivate pepsin. They increase the lower esophageal sphincter tone, which is very important. Because for the GERD, the gastroesophageal reflux disease, the, the lower sphincter, okay, lower esophageal sphincter is weak. Okay, so the acid can leak up into the esophagus and call this heartburn. Okay. So if uh, these drugs can increase the lower esophageal sphincter tone, this is very good, okay? And that's why they could use in the reflux disease. Uh, aluminum hydroxide also is insoluble, okay? Which is good in this case. I don't need it to be absorbed, right? I need it to be, be polite, stay here, guy, okay? Aluminum hydroxide for an, an insoluble colloid in the presence of acid. And the lines the gastric mucosa, okay? Lines the gastric mucosa. Uh, to provide a physical and chemical uh, barrier. Physical, because chloromycolloid on the surface of the mucosa, and chemical, because it is uh, it's, it has the antacid effect, okay, so it protects the acid, or even the acid, if acid comes, acid will be neutralized. Okay, uh, uh, it has low onset of action, and also inactivate pepsin, both of them inactivate uh, pepsin, and uh, the, uh, that's why, so this guy goes barrier, magnesium. Aluminum oxide causes constipation. So they, they said, why don't we use a combination of these two drugs? Okay, just so, so just combination of them will minimize the constipation and diarrhea. Okay, uh, uses of antacids, uh, non-prescription uh, remedies for the treatment of intermittent heartburn, very common, uh, common used and uh, in this regard and dyspepsia. Aluminum and magnesium containing antacids are used for symptomatic relief of peptic ulcer. Okay, yeah, they provide some relief. You know, you cannot keep using the uh, H2 blockers and proton bomb inhibitors for long time, so you have to take some holiday between these drugs. Uh, so you can use in the, in, the, in the interim some antacids for some time, and then uh, even you can use also some natural uh, uh, remedies. We'll discuss them in a separate video that can help you avoid using so much of uh, proton pump inhibitors and h blockers. So anyway, you can use the antacid. They can provide just very rapid relief of the hyperacidity, and also they can give some time uh, for the uh, peptic, for the gastric epithelium to regenerate and to heal, for the ulcer to heal, okay? But they are not used as useful as proton pump inhibitors and h blockers in peptic ulcer. So they are, I mean, uh, less eff efficient in this regard, but they are one of the choices you can use for treatment of peptic ulcer. Maybe useful for GERD patients, as we said, because they increase a lower esophageal uh, uh, sphincter tone and re uh, reduce esophageal pressure. Uh, drug interactions, uh, by altering gastric and urinary pH, they can affect number of drugs such as aliprinone, imidazole, antifungals, by altering rates of dissolution and absorption, by availability and renal elimination. So, and in addition, aluminum and magnesium antacids can chelate other drugs. Chelate means they bind, I don't leave them. So they chelate uh, other drugs and they take them into the, uh, from the, through the GIT into the stool forming in some complex that pass through GIT without absorption. That's generally prudent to avoid concurrent administration of antacids and drugs intended for systemic absorption. Generally, you need to space them uh, uh, by two, uh, two hours before or after taking any drugs. So you space them uh, uh, two hours before or after. This will, uh, you avoid the chelation and all of these drug interactions. Okay, that's it for now. Uh, next, uh, next video, we will uh, talk about ulcer protective drugs, okay, uh, such as carbinoxolone, uh, such as bismuth compound, sacral fate. We'll talk to them about next video. Until then, I will see you, inshallah. I hope uh, you will be happy seeing this video and see you soon in our next video.